So to continue on this topic of nonlinear dimensionality reduction and manifold learning, we're going to just take one step back and talk about what is high dimensional data. You know, you may have heard this term before, and it's kind of an intimidating term. Like, is my data, like people have data uh, <laughs> insecurity, like is my data high dimensional enough? Is it big enough? Is it complicated enough? And so let's demystify this a little bit by talking about what is high dimensional data and what makes data high dimensional and when is it high dimensional enough? Because after all, if we're going to be de reducing the dimension on of data, it needs to be something that is large enough to be reduced by. Okay, so let's take a, let's take an analogy here that's a hopefully super intuitive to people and talk about individuals, humans. Okay, so everyone is a certain um, everyone has a height. Okay, that's something that is true about me. Like I am approximately 170 centimeters tall. Um, this is something that is true about me, and this is something that I can measure um, about a bunch of people. So I can, for example, gather a, a data set where uh, everyone is, uh, you know, everyone takes up a row and I can measure their height, okay? So we can have a bunch of people, let's say I have Abby and then I have Brett um, and then I have Carl and then I have Divya and so on and so forth and I can make this large spreadsheet of people and how tall they are and I'm gonna write them down right here, okay? So I have a data set of everyone and how tall they are. Now. There's a lot more to me and everyone else in the world than just how tall we are. This is a true fact about who we are, but we are all multidimensional creatures. And there's other things that are true and interesting about me and all of these other lovely folks over here than just how tall we are. So for example, we can talk about uh, how big our shoes are. We have our shoe size, okay? These don't have to be physical characteristics. It could be things that are true about our family relationships, like how many siblings we have, okay? It could be things like how many years of school that we've been to, uh, what are our preferences in terms of favorite movies that we can watch. These are all things that are true about us. And so if you compile this spreadsheet, you'll end up with a high dimensional data set because each dimension, each measurement is a characteristic, something that we can measure about the individuals, which are the samples. And so if we compile this uh, into, a, into a data set, what we end up with is a matrix. This is our favorite way of representing data. And I'm gonna call this big X here for X matrix. And the matrix is going to be a rectangle that is going to be an M by M matrix, where N is the number of samples in this case, in my example here, n is the number of individual, individual people that we have in our data set, and m is going to be the number of measurements, right? So that's just however many things that you felt like measuring about these people. So here I've named three of them. So my data matrix will end up being n number of people by three, which is the number of measurements. And when we're reducing dimensionality, what we're concretely talking about is reducing the dimensionality of the data set three into something that's smaller than three. Okay, so we don't need much. You can reduce three to two, and that's a reduction. So I can have a three-dimensional data set, which would be, after all, kind of hard to visualize on a piece of paper if you were to write a report and have to look at it on the screen or print it out. And so it is, in fact, quite useful to be able to reduce three-dimensional data down to two dimensions, like our example earlier with the, uh, with the ring I talked about in the intro video, okay? This is a three-dimensional data set that we'd like to be able to flatten and reduce down to two dimensions so that we can make a plot on a piece of paper if we felt like it. So this is the form of our data set. And now let's talk about reducing high-dimensional data. I hinted at this in a previous video and we started talking about this notion of distance. And I basically told you that the whole trick, the entire trick about manifold learning is cleverly defining what it means for something to be close to something else and what does it mean for something to be far away. So to remind you, let's start with something like that's like the simplest um, way of defining the notion of a distance. So let's say that, uh, so every, um, every row here is gonna be a person, right? So this is X1, this is my first person, X2, et cetera, et cetera, X sub I, the ith person, okay? And we can plot all of this on some kind of axis. So let's say that this is my first person, um, X2 is over here and X3 is over here. And this is plotted in my measurement space, okay? So however many dimensions of people that I have measured. Now I have three, these three um, data points right here. Okay, and you can kind of see just by looking at it in this way that some of them are closer to each other than to others, right? So for example, these two points are closer and those two points are farther away. 
Now, you can see this by looking at it, but how do we actually quantify this? We need to be able to put numbers on these distances, right? So the easiest way to be able to define a distance of some kind is with Euclidean distance. So what we can do here is uh, go back to our vector calculus and linear algebra. And what we can do is define, go back to using the same colors. Uh, let's say I have xi, right? This is my data point xi, and this is my data point xj. And my origin is over here. So here are the two vectors um, that describe xi and xj. So in the analogy of my people example over here, xi would just be the list of height, shoe size, and number of siblings for person i. And xj would be the list of height, shoe size, and siblings for person j. And the distance between them is simply the length of this vector. So this is the distance I want, OK? Simplest notion of distance, also called the Euclidean distance. It's just the length of that vector there. And I can compute it by taking the norm of xi minus xj. OK? Now, this double bar notation is uh, just a shorthand Sorry for vector norm. So this is the norm or the magnitude of this vector. Okay, whatever is inside, I'm just taking the norm of this vector. So xi minus xj gives me this vector right here that I've drawn as a dotted line. And so this notation just means whatever the distance, the, the length and the magnitude of that vector is, that is the distance I want. Okay? Next, what we're going to do is apply a really useful formula and say that this formula here is great. It's totally true. But uh, if we apply something that is called the cosine theorem, we can rewrite that as dij squared is also equivalently expressed as the magnitude of xi plus the magnitude of xj. Okay, so literally this length here and this length here. And minus two times the dot product of xi and xj times the cosine of the angle between them. Here, the cosine is this angle right here. OK? Now, there's a reason that I've rewritten the formula in this way by using the cosine theorem. If I can find a, another orange marker, that is, ah, there we go. So much more satisfying. Cosine theorem. OK, so I have this equivalent formula here. And what this gets me is this notion of the dot product between the two things, because it's actually the magnitude of the individual data points minus something that is proportional to the dot product between these two vectors and the angle between them. OK, so if you've heard of something like the cosine similarity, right, this is a closely related concept. Um, and this quantity on here is known as a scalar product because it's a dot product between the two vectors, uh, which is a product, and it is a single number because it's a dot product, which makes it a scalar, okay? The scalar product is also commonly known as the similarity. So I'm walking us away from this notion of distance to a notion of similarity, because after all, we sort of, at least in an English word way, know that these are kind of dual concepts. Something that is more distant should be less similar. Something that is more similar should be less distant. And so I'm trying to connect that intuition about those English words with a concrete mathematical formula for how do we connect these notions of distance and similarity with data points that we have in a matrix. And so another equivalent way of writing this formula, if we make a bunch of assumptions about normalizing these vectors and length of things, is that what's approximately true here is that distance is equal to 1 minus similarity, where S is my similarity matrix. OK, so this is the way in which distance and similarity are related. And what's coming up next is that we're going to be keeping we're going to we're going to keep going. OK, we are going to lean into this notion of defining distances as things that we can compute on vectors, defining similarities and then manipulating the relative similarities and distances between our data points in order to reduce the dimensionality of the data set in such a way that what we end up with is a lower dimensional representation of the same data set that still tells us something that's illuminating, that gains us intuition, that allows us to visualize and communicate the data, and hopefully learn something about our system as well.